So where do I start? Of course, my starting point has to be the placenta because that's where the oxygen-rich blood is picked up by the fetus. Now, what is happening in the placenta? The blood is being oxygenated. And what are your target organs? Where do I need to get this blood to? Of course, I need to get it to the coronaries and the carotids there, right? So remember, the carotids and the coronaries are branches of, are, are, or take off from the arch of the aorta, right? See, the coronaries start off from the root of the aortic arch, whereas the carotids take off from the arch of the aorta. So that is where I need to get this oxygen-rich blood to. And who is my carrier? So what's happening in the placenta is basically blood is being prepared, right? And who is waiting there? You have the first adaptation of fetal circulation, which is called as the umbilical vein, who is waiting at the placental end to pick up oxygen-rich blood. Right, So, the umbilical vein is at the placenta and will pick up your order for oxygen-rich blood soon. Does that sound familiar? Well, just a swiggy way of saying things. Okay, So, blood is being prepared at the, at, at the placenta and the umbilical vein is at the placenta and will pick up your order for oxygenated blood pretty soon. So, the blood that the umbilical vein picks up from the placenta is around 80% oxygen saturated or the partial pressure of oxygen is around 80 in the blood that comes from the placenta through the umbilical vein. Now, let's see what happens to blood in the umbilical vein. The major branch of the umbilical vein as it enters the umbilicus, okay, the umbilical vein from the placenta enters the fetal fetus at its umbilicus and then ascends upwards as what we call as the left portal vein, which is what I've shown now, okay. So, the left portal vein is the first and direct branch of the umbilical vein. Now, here we have a problem. The umbilical vein is bringing in very, very oxygen-rich blood, 80% saturated blood. And if you let it mix with the portal circulation, remember there's a main portal vein. The main portal vein carries impure blood from the fetal GIT and lower limbs. How is the main portal vein formed? The main portal vein is formed by the fusion or the joining of the splenic vein and the superior mesenteric vein or the mesenteric and the splenic veins, both of which carry impure blood of around 27% oxygen saturation. So, here is the left portal vein coming with 80% blood and the main portal vein coming with 27% blood oxygen saturation. Now, both of these would mix inside the liver uh, in the hepatic sinusoids and then it gets picked up by the hepatic vein before it joins the IVC. So, if that happens or if I let that happen unabated, what happens is that the hepatic venous blood will only be 55% oxygen saturated. And then again, there's a problem because the IVC blood is going to be desaturated as well. So, if you assign the circulation in this route, all the job that the placenta has done is going to go waste because we want close to around 65% oxygen, 70% oxygen to reach the brain and the heart for the fetus. Fetus does not require the 90% oxygen that we adults require. It just requires around 65% oxygen for all its functions to happen. But here, if I let this 80% mix with the 27% in the main portal system inside the liver, then the blood that's going to go to the heart is going to be only 55% saturated. I do not want that to happen. And that is where the first shunt of fetal circulation comes into play, which is what we call as ductus venosus. So, ductus venosus is a second adaptation that's unique to fetal circulation. You don't see that in adult circulation and that is the first shunt. Remember, the fetal circulation has five adaptations in three shunts. The first adaptation was the umbilical vein. The second adaptation is the ductus venosus, which also is the first shunt of the fetal circulation. Now, the, the advantage of having a ductus venosus as a bypass channel to bypass the liver. Now, what the ductus venosus basically does is to bypass the liver and take blood from the oxygen-rich blood from the umbilical vein towards the inferior vena cava directly. Now, that is facilitated by a very unique property of the ductus venosus, which we'll come to. But remember, Around 80% of the umbilical vein blood would still flow through the left portal vein because that is a major branch. That's the biggest branch. That's a direct continuation of the umbilical vein. So, around 80% would still take the, the uh, traditional route of the left portal vein and mix with the main, main portal venous blood and get into the hepatic veins. But there's another 20 to 25% or 30% that most uh, of the umbilical venous blood that will take this bypass channel of the ductus venosus. It's like you have a highway and you have a small bypass route. Some traffic, some people choose the bypass route to reach earlier. 
So if you do not want to go into the into the town, which is the liver in this, in this case, you can take the bypass and get into the next highway, right? So something similar happens with the ductus venosus. Now, the unique property of the ductus venosus is its shape. Now, there is often an MCQ that's asked for most of these exams as to what is the shape of the ductus venosus. Now, the ductus venosus is a trumpet-shaped vessel. Trumpet, if you've seen those blowing trumpets, it's a trumpet-shaped vessel, as you can see in the picture. It is also called as a Y-shaped vessel because the trumpet fairly much represents a Y shape there. Now, what is the advantage of the ductus venosus being trumpet shaped? Is that imagine you have a hose in your hand, a hose that, that pumps water, and you squeeze the tip of the hose, right? So what happens is that the water starts flowing in a in a faster velocity, at a faster velocity, like a jet being propelled forward. Now, this is exactly what ductus venosus does to the blood that goes through it. Being a, a, a Y-shaped or a trumpet-shaped vessel, blood that comes from the umbilical vein is accelerated or pushed forward or thrusted forward when it passes through the ductus venosus. Now, this helps to alter the velocity of the blood. If you have around 15 centimeters per second of flow in the umbilical vein, when it comes to the ductus venosus, the flow increases to around 40-45 centimeters per second. Uh, this is what is called as a physiological stenosis of the ductus venosus. So the blood velocity increases from 16.3 centimeters on an average in the intrahepatic segment or the intrafetal segment of the umbilical vein to around 65 to 75 centimeters per second in the ductus venosus in some cases. Usually it's around 45, 50, 50 that we see, but you could potentially push it up to around 65 to 70 centimeters per second of blood flow velocity in the ductus venosus. Now, this can be seen if you're familiar with your Dopplers on ultrasound. The reason the ductus venosus gives you an aliasing of color, it's neither orange nor, nor blue as you can see here. This area is being aliased. That's because blood flows at a very turbulent, higher, higher velocity through the ductus venosus than the umbilical vein. Now, this is the ductus venosus and this is the umbilical vein. You can see the difference in color there. In the ductus venosus, the blood flow is much, much more accelerated, which is why, which is what gives you that slight aliasing in color as well. And if I look at the velocities of flow, the ductus uh, venosus gives you a velocity of more than 45 centimeters per second, whereas the umbilical vein gives you a velocity of less than 20 centimeters per second. Now, this is a very, very favorable adaptation to push blood at a different velocity than the native blood that flows in the umbilical vein. Now, where do we have this deoxygenated blood in the fetus? All the deoxygenated blood in this fetus is right now at the or in the right ventricle of the heart. And remember, we said the saturation of blood in the right ventricle is around 52%. So that is deoxygenated blood. There's not much of a difference between oxygenated and deoxygenated blood in a fetal circulation, unlike in adult circulation. That's again one of the peculiarities of the fetal circulation. But oxygen saturated blood or saturated or oxygenated blood will be around 65 percentage. Deoxygenated blood will be around 52 percentage. That's because of the mixing that happens in fetal circulation, which you do not have in the adult circulation. But you need 65 percent to call it as saturated. If it goes below 55, it's around, it's called as desaturated blood. So all this desaturated blood is now pooled up in the right ventricle of the heart. Okay. So it's blood that, 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 that would include the native impure blood from the IVC the impure blood from the SVC and the blood that flows from the hepatic vein into the IVC as well. So it's, it's, it's purely a, a collection of impure blood that's there in the, or desaturated blood that's there in the right ventricle. Now remember, we need to get this blood out into the placenta by passing the lungs. That is the second part of our job card. So the blood in the right ventricle, of course, has only a single exit and that exit is the main pulmonary artery. Now, when the main pulmonary artery takes this blood out, it reaches a point where it has two options. Okay, So, if it reaches this junction that I've marked here, it has got two options to go. It can either take the branch pulmonary arteries and go to the lungs or, now what happens there? Now, if, if the blood flows into the lungs, can it really flow into the lungs in a fetus? Now, for blood to flow into the lungs, the lungs should be a low resistance circuit. Remember in the fetus, the fetus is not breathing. I mean, it is it is breathing, but it's not breathing in air. What it is breathe, what it breathes in is the amniotic fluid. And when you have fluid in the capillaries of the lungs or on the alveoli, 
Uh, the capillaries that surround the alveoli are in a state of constant vasoconstriction. Remember, the vasodilator for the lung capillaries is oxygen. So, any lung that does not have oxygen, the capillaries of the lung will be severely constricted. And because the capillaries of the lung are constricted, the resistance offered by the lungs to blood flow will be very, very, very high. Remember, the the resistance or peripheral vascular resistance as we call it is determined by the capillary network of the end organ. Now here if you take blood in the main pulmonary artery or the branch pulmonary arteries, the end organ is the, is the lung where there is a very very high resistance because the lung is filled with fluid and not with air. So there is a complete lack of oxygen in the lungs and this lack of oxygen constricts the pulmonary vessels therefore you have very very high resistance to blood flow to the lungs. So blood in the MPA would think of flowing to the lungs but because the lung vascular resistance is very very high that does not seem to be a favorable option. So blood in the MPA would not want to flow into the lungs because of severe resistance from the, those sides and therefore what you have on the other hand is downstream you have a placenta right. Now, the placenta is a very, very, very low resistance circuit. Okay. So, if I need the blood in the right ventricle, the impure blood in the right ventricle, as we said at the beginning, to bypass the lung and reach the placenta from the main pulmonary artery, I need to create a channel or, or, or a tunnel through which blood can reach the placenta. Now, how can it reach the placenta directly from the MPA? It cannot. So, I need to find a highway that will take my blood or impure blood in the MPA to reach the placenta. And that highway that goes to the placenta is the aorta, right? So, from the aorta, you have the common iliacs. From the common iliacs, you have the internal and the external iliacs. From the internal iliacs arise the umbilical arteries that flow into the placenta. So, if I find a way to connect my main pulmonary artery to the umbilical artery and not the branch pulmonary arteries, I can achieve my goal of bypassing the lungs and taking the blood, impure blood, right out into the placenta. Right. So, all that I need to do to design this is to create a small tunnel from the main pulmonary artery into the aorta. Right. If I achieve that or if I manage to do that, the impure blood in the, in the main pulmonary artery will eventually reach the placenta through the aorta, through the common iliac, through the internal iliac, through the uh, umbilical arteries into the placenta, right? So, that is the fourth adaptation of fetal circulation or the second or the third shunt of fetal circulation. Remember the first two shunts were the ductus venosus and the foramen ovale. The third shunt or the fourth adaptation, including the umbilical vein, the four adaptations now is the ductus arteriosus. Now, as I said before, if you look at blood at this junction of the main pulmonary artery, you have three options now. Blood can uh, flow to the left pulmonary artery, to the right pulmonary artery, or it can flow into the uh, ductus arteriosus into the aorta. Now, as we said, because of the severe pulmonary vasoconstriction, the pulmonary vascular resistance is very, very, very high. And on the other hand, downstream, you have a very, very, very low vascular uh, or a low, low resistance vascular bed, which is the placenta. So, you have high pulmonary vascular resistance, low placental vascular resistance. So, given a choice, the blood in the main pulmonary artery would not want to take the high resistance channel to the lungs. It would rather take the low resistance channel downstream to the placenta. So, the ductus arteriosus helps us achieve that goal very easily. So, right now, if you see the impure blood in the right ventricle flows out into the main pulmonary artery, bypasses the left and right branch pulmonary arteries and rather takes the ductus arteriosus route out into the aorta. This blood comes down through the aorta, flows through the common iliacs, the internal iliac and finally the umbilical arteries that carry blood back into the placenta. So, the umbilical arteries now become the fifth adaptation of fetal circulation and that is something that you will not find i mean the adaptations of fetal circulation are basically stuff that you would not find in the adult in the adult circulation that's why it's called as a adaptation in fetal circulation now the fifth adaptation the umbilical arteries has been designed so that you could get out the impure blood from the aorta into the placenta to pick up oxygen so that is the fifth adaptation 
So the impure blood from the right ventricle takes the path of the ductus arteriosus, gets out into the aorta, comes down through the aorta into the iliacs, and then finally takes the umbilical artery route to go into the placenta. There's, when, there's another very important adaptation here that happens. Now, the, the ductus arteriosus joins the aorta after your three neck vessels have been given off. So, which means the impure blood from the right ventricle does not go to the brain or to the, uh, because the carotids take off before the ductus arteriosus join the aorta. So, there's no mixing of the impure blood before it reaches the carotid arteries as well. There's another subtle point that we need to remember, right? So, with that, we have achieved our second target, our second goal of, of deoxygenated blood from the fetus being directed to the placenta rather than the lungs to pick up oxygen. Now, we need to be aware of a few major events that happen at birth. Remember, the, the, the fetus is inside the mother's womb, which is a very, very warm space to be in, in every sense of the word. Now, once the baby is born out into this world, into a delivery room of off late most delivery rooms have an air condition so the temperature inside the delivery room is completely different from the warm environment that the fetus was in inside the mother's womb so what happens is that this sudden fall in temperature is sensed by the wartens jelly if you remember the wartens jelly in the in the umbilical cord the wartens jelly is very very susceptible to cold temperature the moment it senses cold temperature the Wharton's jelly just starts to contract. Remember, you, imagine you keep a little bit of jelly inside the fridge compartment, it immediately solidifies, right? So very similarly, the Wharton's jelly is very susceptible to temperature changes, to low tem temperature. The moment the baby comes out of the warm environment inside the mother's womb, the Wharton's jelly forms a very, very tight, constricting band around the cord vessels. And other suddenly leads to decreased or reduced blood flow in the umbilical vessels of the cord. So, the other major event that happens is that you cut and clamp the placenta. Rather, you clamp and cut the placenta, and the placenta is taken out of the equation now. And on top of that, you put a clamp as well, right? So, the placenta is no longer functional. The Wharton's jelly constriction itself reduces blood flow in the umbilical cord. On top of that, you clamp and cut the cord. So, the placenta is completely gone out of the equation now. And on the other hand, what happens is that the baby starts breathing with its first cry, the first breath is taken in and that's when the lungs start to expand. All the fluid that was there in the lungs, the amniotic fluid and the secretions that were there in the lung is pushed out because of the high pressures of, the, of, of constricting lungs in the de during delivery. The, the fluid goes out and when the baby starts to take its first breath, a lot of oxygen-rich air goes into the lungs. Now, as we said, if you remember, oxygen in the lung is a very, very potent vasodilator. The moment the lungs get oxygen, the pulmonary capillaries start to open up. Okay, So this leads to significant pulmonary vasodilatation and therefore there's a, there's a stark or a very sharp fall in the pulmonary vascular resistance as well. So what happens is that once you have cut and clamped the cord, the placental vascular resistance now becomes infinity. It becomes very, very, very high. And because the lungs take in air and oxygen, the pulmonary vascular resistance suddenly, suddenly starts to fall. So, it's been a complete reversal that happens from what was happening in fetal circulation. Remember, in fetal circulation, the placenta was a very low resistance circuit and the lungs were very, very high because it was waterlogged and there was no oxygen to, to dilate the capillaries. But once birth happens, once delivery happens, the placenta is clamped and the cord is cut, and the lungs start to get oxygen, there's a complete reversal of the system. The pulmonary vascular resistance now becomes very, very low and the placental vascular resistance is almost infinity because there's no placenta in the first place and you've clamped the cord. So now, if you go back to the other picture of what happens to blood in the right ventricle, now again, when it reaches the main pulmonary artery, you have two options. It could flow to the lungs or it could flow to the placenta through the ductus arteriosus. Now, because the downstream resistance is very, very high, and the lungs resistance, the pulmonary resistance is very, very low. The blood in the main pulmonary artery now starts flowing to the lungs and not to the placenta, right? So, in the lungs, the, the, the partial pressure of oxygen becomes very, very high because of the breaths that it takes. And because you're cutting out the placenta, there's another event that happens. 
Now, the placenta is a very, very rich source of prostaglandins for the baby. So, once you clamp and cut the cord in the fetal circulation, parallelly with the partial pressures of oxygen going up, the prostaglandin levels start to come down as well. So, simultaneously, there are a couple of things that happen. There are too many things that happen together. Okay, the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood increases, the prostaglandins in the blood comes down, blood, blood in the main pulmonary artery starts taking the uh, root of the branch pulmonary arteries to reach the lungs and not the ductus arteriosus to reach the placenta. So, all of these happen very, very quickly immediately after birth. So, now what happens is that the blood flow from the umbilical vein to the ductus venosus is completely stopped because you have clamped the cord. Okay, so first the Wharton's jelly constricts, that reduces the blood flow and immediately after you clamp the cord, so that completely stops blood flow into the umbilical vein and into the ductus venosus. So therefore, there is a functional closure of the ductus venosus and the umbilical vein starts to form clots and gets obliterated as well. Now, simultaneously, we said on the other hand, this pulmonary vasodilatation, so there is a decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance and therefore, there is a reduction in the right heart overload. And the right heart pressure is including the pressure in the right ventricle because the right ventricle is now has got a free outlet. It can very, very freely flow into the lungs. The lungs are very, very receptive because they are huge dilated capillaries. So, any amount of blood from the right ventricle can freely flow to the lungs. So, the right ventricle is under no strain anymore. The right ventricular pressures drastically fall. The right atrial pressures also drastically fall. Now, on the other hand, because there is much, much more blood flowing to the lungs, all this blood returns to which chamber of the heart? Through the pulmonary veins, this increased blood flow to the lungs from the pulmonary veins reaches the left atrium. So, the left atrial pressure starts to go up. Okay, On one hand, you have the right atrial pressure is coming down because there is no resistance to blood flow out of the right ventricle. So, the right ventricle pressure has come down, the right atrial pressure has also come down. On the other hand, there is much, much more blood flowing into the left atrium. So, the left atrial pressures go up. Now, remember you have a foramen ovale flap there. Now, foramen ovale is a flap between the right and the left atrium. It was permitting blood from the right atrium to reach the left atrium during fetal life because of the adaptation that you needed the blood to reach the left ventricle. But here, now here's a situation where the left atrial pressure is much, much higher than the right atrial pressure. So, this little flap valve of the right of the foramen ovale, which was flapping from the side of the right atrium to the side of the left atrium now is pushed back to oppose the septum that is there in the midline. So, foramen ovale was a gap in the septum primum. Now, when the right when the left atrial pressure increases and the right atrial pressure falls, this flap is pushed from the left atrium towards the right atrium and that closes off the foramen ovale. So, it is a flap valve mechanism. When the pressure in the left atrium increases, the flap valve or flap wall of the foramen ovale, flap of the foramen ovale is pushed against the right, uh, against the atrial septum and that blocks the uh, foramen ovale or functionally closes the foramen ovale there. There is functional closure of the foramen ovale that happens and because of the, remember we also said that the prostaglandin levels are less and the, the partial pressure of oxygen is high. Now, the arterial shunts in the fetal circulation, you have two arterial shunts in the fetal circulation, the ductus arteriosus and the umbilical arteries. Now, remember arteries, unlike veins, have smooth muscles and these smooth muscles in the umbilical arteries and the ductus arteriosus can sense the high oxygen level and the low prostaglandin level. Now, the moment these vessels sense high oxygen and low prostaglandins, the, the smooth muscles in these vessels start to immediately constrict and therefore, you also have parallelly the ductus arteriosus constricting and closing and simultaneously the umbilical arteries also constrict and close. This again in response to the high partial pressure of oxygen and the low prostaglandin in the circulation. So, the ductus arteriosus and the umbilical arteries are, are, are being taken out of the equation because they undergo functional closure as a result of the high oxygen and the low prostaglandins being sensed by the smooth muscles in these two vessels.